Yeah. I appreciate the applause. I'm not that much of a celebrity, but still, thank you. So I'm here to talk a little bit about JavaScript craftsmanship. Expect code in this talk. Uh, my name is Francisco. As I was introduced, I work for eBay at the European Product Development Group. Which we have one of our offices here in London, then also in Berlin and Zurich. This talk itself, uh, it's uh, like the previous one. It's my own opinion, and uh, my employer cannot be taken, uh, cannot take any liability for what I say today. So. Bear with me. Um, I'm gonna this, expect some improvisation on this talk. I did it. I only finished the slides. Well, I only did the slides like one hour yesterday before I went to bed. So let's see if it uh, works good. Expect some improvisation. Uh, to talk about uh, JavaScript craftsmanship, we should, uh, or any kind of code craftsmanship, we should start a little bit with code readability and uh, how code overall works. Um, my, my guess is everybody already had tasks given at work or that uh, you saw that someone asked you to do something and you saw it and you thought, well, this will take pretty much five minutes to do. Give me, yeah, give me five, ten minutes, I'll be right back and this is going to be done. Until you actually go into the code base and uh, you find something like this. The, what uh, really happens is that this is pretty much uh, common daily lives for lots and lots of uh, developers. And that task that would take you five minutes to do actually ends up on taking an entire week to find exactly the point where you should edit the code without breaking everything. And by the time that you're, that you're doing it, you're completely frustrated. And mostly it's all because this, the system had really, really bad code. When I'm talking about bad code, I can give you a quick example. This is actually not back server but front-end code. It comes from a Portuguese website called uh, sol.pt. Uh, I don't know if you guys can, uh, the indentation is a little broken, but it's pretty much a whole thing. And in a page which is called load home page, so the thing that loads their index, uh, in, in, the, in the, play, the function that loads their entire index, they have four nested AJAX calls. So anybody that uh, ever is hired into this company and is gonna, gonna try to edit this code, any new feature or do whatever, they're gonna have a copy-paste nightmare here. And uh, it's all because uh, they just hack it through, they didn't care about what they were doing. We could point more errors like the, the JavaScript, the jQuery selectors everywhere and things like that, but let's not go too much into it. So what does really define good code? If uh, I would get one or two persons to say it, anybody wants to volunteer what, uh, in their opinion, defines good code? Okay, so one opinion, the code that you don't have to write, so using generators, that's good. Programming with boxes. Anybody else? Hmm? Super code. I simple code, okay, yes. Simple code, yes. Simple code is also good. In my opinion, one thing that defines really good code, at least it's the first thing that I look when I ever go into a project and try to read it, it's uh, tests. So, So tests are really cool because they prove that the developer that has been writing them uh, paid attention to it. They all have to run independently from each other, the, the, the blind so they don't copy content from one another. And by the way, the photo is not my credit, I just stole it from Google. The, um, and tests are really important. So whenever you want to go read, read into code, it's uh, much more effective to read the tests first than actually reading the logic that people are using. So, and if you really don't agree with this opinion, you're perfectly f fine with it, I can, we can grab a beer and discuss it. But if you don't agree with it, you should have this guy hanged over your wall, hunting your every dreams. So, we'll, one of the topics that we're gonna cover through this talk is a little bit about testing, the stay emphasis on this part. Uh, but another thing that, and the other two parts that we're gonna be talking is uh, a bit, little bit of, uh, an approach to doing object-oriented programming in JavaScript and also some hints on uh, doing functional JavaScript. Uh, but going back into this first topic, writing uh, good code is, uh, depends on another thing. The, like everybody knows, or at least it's widely cir circulated on the internet, the two hardest things of computer science or programming are pretty much invalidating caches, naming things, and off by one efforts. The, um, Naming things in itself, 
I'm not going to dive too much into it, but again, for good quality code, it's really, really, really important. At least in the examples that I have, I'm trying to give proper names. Uh, if you disagree with my names, again, feel free and uh, we can discuss it. They pretty much look like this. And okay, no, it, it, it's not. Actually, I copied this piece of code from uh, a submission in Google Code Jam. Uh, for a comp for a com programming contest, it's okay. But if you ever push code uh, into production that looks like this, and uh, someone else has to maintain it, there is a special place in hell for those people. <laughs> so let's go into the first topic and talk a little bit about tests. So tests, in my opinion, uh, have the, the biggest, they, they have two major aspects. One is running in isolation. The other one is that they have to be readable. So the part that I'm going to explore here is not the, well, also a little bit of running in isolation itself, but it's more the readability part of them. So can anybody in explain me what this function does? Well, what this test does or what it's actually testing. OK, so the testing part is these three lines down here, which depend on uh, file names called A, called C, and I think it's a V somewhere over there in the part that you don't read it. So absolutely no idea what's going on. We don't really know it. If anybody would say that they understand this, congratulations, you're awesome at going through mazes. I really don't think that's uh, readable. Uh, it came from an open source project on GitHub. Not going to disclose which one. But uh, in terms of test readability, uh, I would prefer to have much more something like this. This is actually from a little bit of code that we have uh, in our system uh, within Node to detect which environment we have. And uh, if you go through this, you can read it really, really clean it. You start with the line on the top, when in dev, then you read the test, should detect dev, or should get dev URL, or when it's part, you get a 300. So the, and if you look at it, the separation is pretty clear. You have uh, what is the code that needs to be executed before the test is actually run, before the thing that you're actually testing, going into the before each. And what the test has itself is always exclusively one, uh, one line that uh, defines exactly what's being tested. So in this case, environment that is development should be true, or environment that get environment host should equal the expected URL. Uh, in terms of libraries, in case some, someone is not familiar with this, this is I'm using mock uh, and chai uh, should here. But I'm not going to talk too much about libraries here, so I'm not going to dive into them. Uh, giving you another example, this is from an NPM uh, module that I've built for personal use, which is pretty much a soft cache, so a map with a timeout. You can put stuff inside a map, and after a certain time, they timeout. They, again, following uh, a little bit the same principle. You have a name, say you have the describe, saying after adding an element, should be retrievable, and you have the before each that does the premises on what kind of execution it happens before you do the test. In this case, you just put a, a key value pair inside the caching system, and then it should, it should be retrievable checks that the cache.getKey should equal value. And in terms of, simple, of um, readable code, so simple code, anybody, even if they're not uh, really proficient with the language, would probably come into one of these tests and be able to understand what they're doing, at least the, the overall concept. And within the JavaScript environment, especially the testing frameworks, we have the power that we don't have in other languages of nesting describes uh, and nesting test uh, suites one inside each other. And this becomes really powerful because if you see down here, we have another, uh, another describe for removing the element. And again, you can read it really, really clearly. After adding an element, uh, before put the value, the value in the key. Uh, when removing the element, uh, so before that test in particular removed the element from the key, we just placed it there, but it's okay. We have other tests checking that it was placed. Then it should disappear from the cache. So cache link should equal zero. So anytime that you're trying to, ma to write maintainable codes, uh, the thing that you're probably going to be more happy about when you revisit something after a year is exactly that you have tests that you can read and that you can guarantee that any changes that you're doing are still working. And if you're using a JavaScript environment, not London user groups, I guess you are, uh, Mock and other testing frameworks provide really readable output for the tests that you have. Getting, uh, in this case, I ignore two tests just to, to give an example of how they get displayed. 
but you get pretty much a very descriptive way of reading it. When, when uh, sorry, the environment, when in QA should detect QA and should get QA URL, when in prod should, should get everything. And there is another really interesting part of this, just moving back. Having only one test within, and having just one line of code within uh, your it statement, within uh, the place where you're doing your assertion, means that if something breaks, it's really, really easy to find it. When people sometimes put like seven or eight statements, they will argue, ah, it's okay. If one, if one of them breaks, I will have to fix it anyway. But the thing is, this way you can predict what exactly broke and how long you're going to take to fix it. Under this example, there is an error in this, uh, in this, um, in this test. It's more because I've been lazy to fix it. But that cache clear that you see there shouldn't be there. It should be an, another nested describe with another before each, which should clear the cache, and then on, only then we would, uh, uh, very, we would verify that it was equal zero. So if you do this in your testing environment, every time you want to return to your code, you'll pretty much reach enlightenment. You will feel that uh, things are right, tests are passing. If things break, especially in JavaScript, which is a non-type safe language, and it's not compiled. You, you guys can make changes that break the entire system, and you have absolutely no idea to know that they happen until you actually run the code. So having proper good tests that run through your entire code actually will help detect this. If it was Java, C Sharp, C++, the compilation would catch it. Within a dynamically cast language, that will never happen. So please do tests. That's the first topic, the first uh, message of this part. So. Going into object-oriented, I have uh, a question here. So one thing that I always wonder is how far can JavaScript be actually considered an object-oriented language? And uh, by object-oriented, I guess that everybody here knows what's object-oriented, right? Can any put your hands in the air if you know what's object-oriented programming? Yeah, hey, awesome, lots of people. So for those that put, uh, you, I would say that it's mandatory that you're able to describe every single of these keywords. Yeah. So one thing that happens within JavaScript, especially if you're coming from other languages or you know other languages, these don't exist. You can emulate them. You can do lots of stuff around it. But in reality, JavaScript is not object-oriented. JavaScript is a prototypal-based language, which can be used to build, uh, to simulate object-oriented programming in many, many different ways. Here, I'm going to share my favorite one. I'm not going to argue that it's the more effective or the less effective one. It's the one that I find easier to read, and it's the one that uh, at, at least uh, proves to be more effective for me. So again, going into that soft cache example, uh, within, <coughs> within this, um, this module, so I, I, I hidden the code so it would fit in the slides, but uh, that's the, the entire implementation. What you have here, it's a pure, uh, as pure as, as it can be in JavaScript object-oriented system, where you have an instance, um, uh, instance private stuff that when you do new soft cache, every, everything of this gets, uh, private, uh, gets uh, into the private scope. And uh, all of the stuff that gets attached to the disk scope will go into the pub instance public. I know this can be pretty basic for some people, but uh, I found lots of... Uh, <laughs> Lots of developers not really understanding this concept, so I apologize for those at time repeating the uh, subject. And there is another really, really important thing. If you're building a, an object that is uh, targeted to be instantiable, then please capitalize the name of your object. In, it's a convention across most languages that anything that is capitalized on the beginning of the, of the name of the variable or function or whatever, it's something that can be instantiated. And by instantiated, I mean uh, that you can run a new before that, and it will create you a new instance. And you can build as many news as you want, and it will generate as many instances as you want. Under this environment, yes, we can, uh, we can simulate object-oriented programming. And please do so, because revisiting the part of the test, this allows your code to be testable. If, you're, if you just build instantiable objects, you can uh, build a complete new instance every time before you run all the tests and you guarantee a deterministic state before you actually uh, test your code or in the beginning of the execution. So giving you a very, uh, very quick other example, for that environment code, uh, this is, uh, there's a, a little bit missing here, but uh, 
it's pretty much this. Can anybody identify what kind of design pattern it's being used in this, uh, in this page as object oriented? Yeah, awesome. Ah, yeah, sorry, I forgot I wrote that. <laughs> as I said, some improvisation, I apologize. <laughs> Yeah. So this is singleton exactly because the um, because down here I'm kind of in the way. But uh, when we're exporting the module, we're exporting directly the instance. So this object itself, the the environment object, is never instantiable in itself outside of this file. You can only require it, and you get directly an instance. And has require only run only runs the code that's inside once. You pretty much every time you require the file that contains this object, you always get the same instance already built. So I have four minutes and a half. Let me try to go through the next part. This is the most experimental of them all in terms of talk, at least. So I hope it goes all right. Who's, who from here codes functional JavaScript? Yeah, some hands, around 10 people. Cool. Let's see if I can go. So my first connection with functional JavaScript was with Lisp. If you never tried Lisp, I totally suggest you to try it. Awesome language, lots of parentheses, and it really, really makes sense. This uh, is from XKCD. No time to let you guys read. Search XKCD Lisp and you'll find this. So, um, go, let's, uh, ah, by the way, that's a bug. I apologize. I only noticed after I created the slide. Um, it's uh, adding 3 plus 4 is not 4. Um, <laughs> so, let's imagine that you have uh, an adding function. And uh, we, the, the adding function does that. Everybody can code an adding function. If, if you can't, please, well, go somewhere. Uh, what happens if I want to run the add function twice so that, it, um, so that in practice I provide only one argument and it adds the same value one to each other so that we can in, in practice do a double function? From uh, those that, uh, I'm not asking you to write it, but from those that say that they do functional programming, could you write the twice function? Yeah, okay. So, a twice function would look something like this. Um, pretty much, uh, if I try to explain you this, which I can't, this is a monad, and, uh, well, it's not a monad exactly, but uh, it, it gets close to it, but it's, um, pretty much you, you provide a function that, um, you, you provide, uh, you pass a function reference into the twice. The twice on itself returns another function that will accept a value and will run uh, that value that it, that it gets to the add functions, to the add function that it was passed. So pretty much the twice will work with any kind of function that you pass that returns two arguments. The thing is that it's gonna pass whatever value it has into that, has the first and second argument of it. So. Uh, I'm not going to very deep into functional programming. You could have like a two hour talk about this it's just to get a quick a glimpse. Uh, but how would you apply something like this? Uh, if, um, if you have a function that looks something like this, uh, what could, could we improve in it? The, um, at least looking at it, I personally don't like having multiple nested functions within each other. So the first thing that I, would, uh, that I would immediately try to solve would be this part here, uh, which is already a third level of function, which it's a bit of a code smell. And uh, these two here are a bit of code repetition because you're just calling the same function over and over in different, in different instances that you have. So to solve that first one, what you can do is actually, instead of having the entire function there, you can extract it. Yeah, you guys from the back can read it, right? Yeah. So you can extract it and uh, simply create another function that returns uh, directly the function that is passed, has a success function down here. This is cool because it allowed uh, for uh, a much easier readability. If I go back, if you try to read this success function, you, ha you go success function, then another function, and then it uh, then does the finishes the ID extractor and the snippet generate, generates the snippet. So. I'm not looking at that, I want to look at the update item preview, that is the function that we're looking at, and I just want to read success function, cool, then uh, uh, if, when it's successful, it will call the iframe loaded callback, and uh, in this case, it passes the ID, it returns a function, it will do that stuff. And for the green part that we, that we have here, which is the duplicated code, we can actually extract it into a call function, a bit similar to the twice that we had, where you simply map it. You say 
you build a list of the objects that you want, where you want to call the same function over, over and over again, and uh, you simply map it and say, call this function there. And in this case, it only had two, two elements, but if you have a collection of like five or six objects that you have to update, it uh, becomes much easier to read if you just pass a list and map into that list. So just let to read, be able to read the code without the lines. I'm also already going through over time, so I'm not going to give you much time to do that. So here is another example. Working with promises, this kind of design pattern actually is really, really cool. So if you read it, we can read uh, up here in line t uh, 11 to 12 that uh, promise, when the promise is over, then remove, uh, remove from pull function, uh, remove this promise from the pull function, then execute the next promise. Again, this, we could pass a, a callback directly into, into the first 10, which call, says remove from pull function. But uh, we can simply abstract it, to, uh, abstract it out and make the promise itself much easier to read. So uh, that was 20 minutes. This last part, I really didn't rehearse it, so sorry if, I, if it went bad. So if you guys have any questions, feel, feel free to ask. Ooh.